Behave yourself, Jaws. In this two-part tutorial, I will walk you through a gem fastening diagram and try to remove some of the mystery and confusion of how to use a gem fastening diagram to cut a gemstone. In part one, I will explain everything you need to know to be able to cut a gemstone using the diagram. In part two, I will explain some additional information that you will need to know about gem fastening diagrams that, although not needed to cut a stone using this diagram, you will need to understand the additional topics to cut any gem fasting diagram. A gem fasting diagram is basically the same as a cookbook recipe. It is the recipe or list of instructions showing you how to cut a specific design using a gemstone. So here's an example of a gem fasting diagram. I will use this gem fasting design in this tutorial to help you understand all the parts of the diagram. I guess the first question is where can you find gem cutting designs? Well, you can purchase gem cutting books where famous gem cutters have assembled some of their favorite gem fastening diagrams. And you can search online for these books or find them at pretty much any lapidary store. You also can go online to facetdiagrams.org. This is an online database that houses thousands of designs. I will go into a lot more detail about facetdiagram.org in part two. You can also find designs in back copies of old gem cutting magazines like the Lapidary Journal. Another great place to find gem cutting designs are in newsletters from your favorite lapidary club like the United States Fasting Guild. Often a gem cutting designer will publish their latest creation and the story behind the cut in the newsletter of the gem club they belong to. Also, just search online for gem cutting diagram or fastening diagrams as many websites of gem cutters and some other gem related organizations have some gem cutting diagrams on their websites. Finally, I would say you could use Robert Strickland's computer program called GemCAD or some other gem cutting design software and create your own unique gem cutting design. GemCAD can be used for free on a trial basis for 30 days. So if you are so inclined, give it a try. And Robert has a number of videos on YouTube to walk you through how to use his software. Robert can normally be found in Tucson at the annual gem show and regularly offers beginners, intermediate, and advanced classes on his software, but you have to sign up in advance. If anyone out there knows of other places to find gem fastening designs, please let us all know in the comment section. So after looking at some of the places I've just described, you finally find a design that interests you. How do you read the design? How do you understand it? Well, first off, Look at the title of the cutting diagram to see if it's right for you. Uh, in this case, the file name is PC01.006B and it is an SRB with stack mains. SRB means Standard Round Brilliant. As the creator of the fastening design, you get to name the design. You can name it after a loved one, a mythical creature, your favorite pet, anything you wish. The name of the designer is listed. In this case, there's two. The designers are R.H. Long and N.W. Steele. This pair has created a large number of very unique gem cutting designs. If the design was published in a magazine or a newsletter, that information would be included here along with the date the design was created or published. In the example shown here of another fasting diagram for PC01.102, Fairy Wand, it was published in the Lapidary Journal in the November 1972 edition on page 1163. And the creator of the fairy wand design was Edith B. Strout. The particular design that we're using today for our example was not published, so the designers are documenting when they created it. Next is a critical piece of information. 
The angles for the refractive index that the design was made for is listed. In this case, the angles for refractive index are 1.540. And once you've cut for a while, you will know that that means this design is ideal for faceted quartz, including amethyst, citrine, smoky quartz, clear quartz, rose quartz, rutilated quartz, and praseolite. All of those have the refractive index of 1.54. So each type of gemstone has a refractive index which describes how fast light travels through the material. If the facets of the gemstone are cut at the correct angles based on the refractive index, light will pass into the gemstone from the top or the crown of the stone, hit a facet in the bottom part of the stone, which is called the pavilion, and bounce back up and out through the top of the gemstone, giving what is called brilliance. If the angles are cut poorly, and more importantly, if the angle in the pavilion is cut below the critical angle for that refractive index, light will go into the stone from the top of the gemstone, hit a facet in the bottom of the gemstone, and pass through that facet and not be reflected at all. This is called a window effect, and it's an indication of a poorly cut stone. So if you've seen a stone, gemstone that you can put on the top of a newspaper and read the letters of the newspaper by looking through the top or the table of the stone, you have a windowed stone. The critical angle for quartz is 40 degrees, so when you look at the angle of the facets to be cut for the pavilion, it must be above 40 degrees. In this case, one row of facets is cut at 41 degrees and one at 42 degrees. Since both of these tiers, or rows of facets, are above the critical angle for quartz of 40 degrees, you'll be okay and you won't have a window effect. If you were to cut that row of facets at 39 degrees or less, the light would pass through the stone, not be reflected again, causing a window effect. There's many sources online to find the refractive index of gemstones. One example is the International Gem Society, which has a table of refractive indexes on their website. The next piece of information shown in the diagram is the number of facets required to cut this gem design. In this case, 57 facets plus 16 girdle facets, or a total of 72 facets, have to be cut and polished for this gemstone. This is important to know because you will have to cut and polish each one of these facets. There are some designs that have well over 200 facets. I like cutting a Portuguese design, for example, which has a little less than 200 facets. I've seen several designs published where the designer seemed to be trying to break the world record for number of facets. In some cases, I don't think anyone has ever even test cut those designs. I know I have no plans anytime soon to cut a stone with hundreds upon hundreds of facets, but maybe you'd like to. You can find those designs out there. The girdle is the part of the gemstone that separates the top half or crown of the gemstone from the bottom half or pavilion. The girdle is important as this is what your jeweler attaches the prongs to when he or she sets your gemstone into a piece of jewelry. I will talk a little more about the girdle in part 2 of this video. This diagram calls for a total of 16 girdle facets. Um, this information is also shown under the pavilion section of the diagram for the tier called G1, which means the first set of girdle cutting instructions. And in this case, there's just one set of girdle cutting instructions. But in other diagrams, there may be two or more. G2, G3 would be how you'd see them in, in a diagram. The girdle is always shown at 90 degrees in diagrams. Although, as a pro tip, just know that many gem cutters actually polish the girdle at less than 90 degrees to save a lot of time and unnecessary wear on your polishing lap. And I'll, I'll talk about this later. The next piece of information is 8-fold mirror image symmetry 96 index. The 96 index means that to use this diagram to cut a gemstone, your fasting machine must use a 96 gear index, the round circle that there are 96 teeth around the circle. The diagram will tell you which teeth to cut at which angles, and this is how you fasten each row or tier of the stone. I'll discuss index gears in more detail in part two of this tutorial. Now back to the instructions and information on our design that we're talking about here. Eightfold mirror image symmetry. Here's a screenshot from the GemCAD software of Robert Strickland. In the bottom right is where this information is important. If you are designing gem cuts, you need this information. But if you're just cutting the design, you don't really need this information. 
I will discuss symmetry in a little more detail in part two of this tutorial, but just understand that when you are designing your own gem cutting diagrams, you need to understand symmetry and the fold, like eight fold and mirror symmetry. But again, this information is not at all needed for cutting. The next grouping of instruction does matter to gem cutters. L is for length of the finish stone, W for the width, T is for the table measured on the long side if it's not square, U is for the table measured on the short side, P is for the pavilion, and C is for the crown. All of those calculations help the cutter ensure that he or she has selected a piece of uncut gem or rough that will work for the design you're interested in, except for the volume information. I don't use the volume information and I don't know anyone who does. But if you're a math geek, have at it. The formula of volume divided by W cubed equals 0 0.198 will give you the volume of the stone. W3 is the width of the stone cubed or the width times the width times the width. And once you have the volume of the stone, you can use it to determine and estimate the carat weight that the stone will be after you cut it except that you also need to know, you'll have to Google it, the specific gravity of the gem, and each gem has a different specific gravity, and you have to crank all this information through another formula, and then you'll know how much the stone should weigh when you're done cutting it. I don't do that, I cut it, and then I put it on the scale and weigh it. All the cutters know, unfortunately, you'll generally end up with 20 to 30% of the weight of the stone when you're done cutting. So if you have a 10 carat piece of rough, reasonably well shaped with no inclusions, you can be pretty sure that you're gonna be in the ballpark of three to four carats when you're done. Now it may make a difference if you're using a piece of amethyst from nature that's already kind of shaped as a, the pavilion's pretty much done or the bottom half of the stone goes into a point. But in a general piece of rough, 20 to 30% is what you're looking at. I would certainly appreciate hearing the comments of any cutter who uses the volume calculation, how you use it, how often you use it, and how useful you find it to be. Please let us all know. L divided by W is the length to width ratio. This is an important ratio as it will let you know if you have selected a piece of rough that is large enough to cut what you plan to cut. If the size of your gem rough exceeds the length to width ratio of the diagram, you can use that piece of rough. So if you have a piece of rough that's 8 millimeters long and 10 millimeters wide, and you want to use this rough to cut this design, then you already know that the biggest stone you can cut using this design is 8 millimeter, because the length divided by width is 1. And given your rough is 8 by 10, the width of 8 millimeters in this formula means the length will also be 8 millimeters if you cut with this diagram. So you're going to lose 2 millimeters off of the 10 millimeters length of the stone. More importantly, if you know the size of the stone you want to cut, this form will help you select the right piece of rough. If you know you want to cut a 10 millimeter stone, then using the length to width ratio on your 8 by 10 piece of rough, you know that this piece of rough is not big enough to cut a 10 millimeter stone. T divided by width, or table to width ratio, goes along with the U to W ratio, which is also a table to width ratio. But things get a little confusing when you use the U to W ratio. The rule is that T is always the greater than or equal to U. This rule applies if, for example, you're cutting a rectangular or emerald cut. In that case, the T to W ratio would be the measure of the table longwise divided by the width of the stone. While the U to W ratio would be the measure of the table shortwise divided by the width of the stone. The T to W and U to W ratios are not that important to me because they will kind of automatically occur when you cut the stone as long as you properly cut your facets and each facet meets the one above it and you use the L to W ratio. So you don't really need the T to W ratio to cut a stone. If you look at our example again, you can see where to stop cutting the table. You see the facet with the B? It's a diamond shape. When you're cutting the table, the last facet you cut, labeled D in this diagram, you stop cutting when you just kiss the top of the diamond in the facet with the B, where the arrow is. Stop where D touches C and B, no need to measure. You'll have the perfect table. The final ratios do matter. The P to W ratio, the C to W ratio are needed to ensure your piece of rough is deep enough to cut. Uh, but again, you need one more piece of information that's not shown here, and that's the width of your girdle. 
And again, my rule of thumb is the girdle should be about 0.3 millimeters. Some people say 0.5. Having a girdle is important so that the jeweler doesn't, again, chip the stone when he sets the prong. And again, the only time you need to cut a girdle to an exact size is if you're entered into a competition. Then you have to cut what the competition instructions say. The P to W ratio gives you the length or depth of the pavilion, the bottom half of the gemstone. The C to W ratio gives you the length or height of the crown. The P to W and C to W plus the estimated girdle thickness are vital information as you're calculating figures to determine if your gem cut design will fit the piece of rough you want to use. And you need this information after you cut the first half of the stone. After you cut the pavilion, which is normally cut first, if you've had an inclusion and you had to cut extra further down in the pavilion, you need to make sure that your C to W ratio, you still have enough space to cut the top half of the stone and don't forget the girdle width. Finally, the file number in the Facet Design Database is listed showing the format the file is in. In this case, an ASC format, which works for GemCAD. This means you can pull this file directly into the GemCAD and tweak it however you would like. You can adjust it for different refractive indexes of different types of gemstones using Robert Strickland's software. At the top of our design page are graphic depictions of the gemstone from various angles, which allows you to visualize the stone and show you how the stone aligns with the teeth of your index gear. This first graphic shows you the view of the stone looking down from the top. Around the edges of the diagram are the index setting from 6 to 96. It shows how the cuts will look at various points or index numbers around the circle. And this also tells you that you need to use a 96 index. Again, using the right index is critical, and the index to use is also shown in the basic instructions that I explained earlier. The letters correspond to the letters in the cutting instructions. The crown generally is denoted with letters. So the A in the diagram shows you where the facet will be cut and the cutting instructions are telling you set the angle of your facet machine at 42.3 degrees and starting with the index tooth of 03, cut the 03, 09, 15, etc. teeth of your 96 index gear for this row or tier of facets. I put an A on each of the 16 facets that will be cut at the 42.3 degree and yes, you may have guessed that the symmetry has a lot to do with showing these cuts in GemCAD. In GemCAD, by selecting eight-fold mirror image symmetry, you only have to put the first facet into the software, and it automatically calculates the index gear tooth to be used for the remaining facets at that angle. But again, you don't need to know this to cut. You just need to follow the instructions under the pavilion and crown. The remaining visual diagrams show the gemstone from all sides, top, side, bottom. These visuals are very helpful when you're cutting for a number of reasons, from helping you figure out how to initially glue stone to the brass top into the quill of your fasting machine. Doesn't matter so much with a round stone, but with a rectangular stone, for example, you need to make sure the longest, flattest part of your rough is set at the 96 degree angle, if that's what the instructions call for. Another common use of these visuals, for me at least, is when I'm putting the final polish step on a row of facets and notice a groove or slight scratch in one of the other facets that I'd previously cut. I know I'll have to go back and repolish that facet, but how do I know which facet it is? By having these visuals, I can look at my gemstone and find the facet that needs to be reworked and I can find it on this visual graphic that I can then go to the cutting instructions, find the angle and the tooth that I need to set my machine to and go back and just touch up that particular facet. These visuals are also useful in the cases where you are repairing a previously cut gemstone or where your jeweler may have chipped a facet. Instead of recutting the stone, by having this visual graphic as a map, you can examine the stone and find the right facet, and then you'll know the angle to set your machine to and the tooth to set your index gear to, and then you can repair the chip. Finally, the G1 is the generally accepted method to show girdle facets. Girdle facets, again, are always at 90 degrees. The G1 shows where to cut the girdle. Another way to know that it is the girdle is that your cutting instructions say the girdle facets are 90 degree angles. And finally, the table is shown in the diagram under the crown and is cut at 0 degrees. 
I hope that part one of this tutorial has helped you take some of the mystery out of gem cutting diagrams and that you now are excited to get out there and cut a gemstone or two. Or at least excited enough to download Robert Strickland's GemCAD software and fill around with designing gem cuts. I'll bet you could come up with an awesome gem design. In part two of this tutorial, I will explain some additional topics that are closely related to understanding a gem fasting diagram, but which are not absolutely necessary for a basic understanding of how to read a diagram. Finally, if you do decide to start designing awesome stone cutting designs, please consider sharing your design and release your design into the public domain for those of us who have no artistic talent for designing gem cuts, but love to cut stones. And I personally am grateful to all the extremely talented artists out there who have been able to envision a gem design and spend their time to develop the perfect design online and then very selflessly put their design that they spent their time creating into the public domain for any cutter to use. I'd just like to say thank you.